we are seeing increasingly more and more in our day and age a more fundamental, essential critique, and that is that you don't have the words of the Bible to begin with. Forget the content. All you have are translations of translations of translations, and you don't have what was written thousands of years ago. So, when I jump into this, we need to ask ourselves, why is the topic of Scripture an important one for apologetics today? And if for no other reason, then when we talk about apologetics, when we go to Scripture and find our foundation for apologetics, and we go to places like 1 Peter 3.15, if you're familiar with apologetics, this should be a familiar passage. It's one of those flagship apologetics verse, but verses. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do so with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ will be ashamed of their slander. But there, is, there are a number of important things to take note within that passage itself. It tells us to always be prepared to give an answer and predicates that on a hope that we have. But what is that hope? Where do we get that hope? Is it a general hope? Is it a happiness? No, obviously, what Peter is communicating to the dispersed church when he writes that letter is that there is a hope, particularly in Jesus Christ, but that is founded in the word of God, in God's revelation. Because, you see, it doesn't matter what apologetic issue we're talking about. We could be talking about worldview issues. We could be talking about homosexuality. We could be talking about evolution versus creation. We could be talking about ethics, the existence of God, and so on and so on. If God has not spoken, coming from the Christian worldview, why give a defense? Why give a reason for the hope that we have? Because if God has not spoken, has not communicated to us, then there really is no reason for an apologetic to give an answer, to give a reason for the hope that we have. But there are all sorts of narratives regarding that foundation within society. In fact, we can look at places like that scholarly work known as the Da Vinci Code. You might be saying, I think it's a, a piece of something. I'm not sure it's a piece of scholarly work. But in it, it says the Bible has evolved through countless translations, additions, and revisions. History has never had a definitive version of the book. And this is a prevalent idea within our society. I get this from atheists. I get it from Muslims. I get it from Mormons. I get it from Jehovah's Witnesses. This is a common narrative. We also have individuals within societies who are academics but write books on this subject that casts doubt on the foundation for the hope that we have. The individual on the screen, Bart Ehrman, is a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is easily one of the most outspoken critics of biblical um, Christianity today. And in a book called Misquoting Jesus, which was a New York Times bestseller, and the week that it came out was number one on Amazon for three weeks, he says, the more I studied the manuscript tradition of the New Testament, the more I realized just how radically the text had been altered over the years at the hands of the scribes. It would be wrong to say, Ehrman says, as some people sometimes do, that the char changes in our text have no real bearing on what the texts mean or on the theological conclusions that one draws from them. And the whole narrative of this book is that the scribes have changed things over the years. What you have now is not what was written thousands of years back then. And so we can argue over the content, but the content is flawed at its base. And this is a common narrative within our society. Undercut the apologetic by undercutting the hope that we have, by undercutting the foundation of Scripture. Now, before I really jump into this, I want to highlight two extremes that I've found both in my academic work along with the apologetic work that I've done. Because sometimes people investigate this topic and they fall into two camps. And I'm going to highlight those camps, if for no other reason, than to help you avoid those camps. The first one is what I'm calling radical skepticism, and that isn't a common, a typical atheist response. And it sounds something like this. 
very similar to what I just capitalized on before. You can't possibly know what the original text of the Bible was. It's been translated so many times, the original meaning has been lost. I hear this on a routine basis. I hear allusions and illustrations of the telephone game, that the, trend, the, the message of the original Bible has been lost, that you can't trust what those authors wrote. But the problem is there's a fundamental issue at the heart of this, which is based on ignorance. Because this is typically, when you dig into people who say these types of things, this is what they're imagining. They're imagining that Jesus said his words in Aramaic or some ancient language. And then his immediate followers wrote down those words in Greek. Now, up until this point, we're mostly correct. That is, on the whole, what happened. But they assume that over time, people were not reading Greek anymore. They weren't speaking Greek. It was not the lingua franca. And so they took all of those Greek manuscripts, they translated them into Latin, and they got rid of all those useless Greek manuscripts. But then more time went on, and people are not speaking Latin anymore, and so they take those Latin manuscripts, and they translate them into languages like German, and they get rid of all those old, stingy, dusty manuscripts. And this goes on and on for multiple languages until eventually we get to our modern English translations, and there's this long history, there's this long thread of time between Jesus' words, or the prophet's words, or any of the authors of the Bible, there's this long thread between them and us. And we can't possibly trust that because it's just too much time. The problem is that is not how you have your Bibles. When you hold a modern English translation of the Bible, it is based on the original Greek and the original Hebrew, along with Translators looking at previous translations, how they rendered certain texts, and then taking into consideration other things, quotations from early Christians, individuals who we refer to as the early church fathers. All of these things go into your modern English translation. This confuses translation with transmission. People think translation. And in one sense, when I hold up my Greek New Testament, yes, this has been translated over and over and over and over. Every time I open it up, I'm translating it. But that's not what people mean when they say the Bible has been translated so many times, you can't trust it. Radical skepticism, the first extreme, the first false extreme, which a lot of people fall into. But there's also another extreme, and unfortunately, this is a typical Christian extreme. And this is what I'm calling absolute certainty. And it sounds something like this. The Bible that I hold in my hands today is exactly, is perfectly the word of God in every single word, comma, and sentence. Now, that might shock you that I just said that, but hear me out for a second. What do I mean by that? Well, we need to ask ourselves, what translation of the Bible are we holding in our hands? Is it a King James translation, a KJV? Well, we need to ask which one. There isn't one KJV. There's the original 1611. There's a 1769 Blaney revision, and then there's an 1873 re revision after that. And they all differ minorly in the words from one another. We could also hold a new King James translation, which is largely the 1769 Blaney revision with updated language, or the more popular NIV, New International Version. But you don't have to stop there. There's today's New International Version. There's the New International Reader's Version and the New International Version 2011. And then there are all sorts of other modern English translations. What Bible are we holding in our hand? What translation is it? Because you see, there have been updates in our modern English translations. And we can go on and on with Bible translations. But what am I getting at? Well, I'm getting at the fact that the Bible has changed in one way. It's just not what the skeptics or those who are holding absolute certainty mean. And let me illustrate this to you by showing you my favorite verse in the 1611 King James Bible. It's 1 Chronicles 28, 16, at Parbar westward, four at the causeway, and two at Parbar. 
Sometimes you just read a verse and it really hits you here. You feeling that right now? <laughs> what on earth does that mean? Does anybody have an interpretation of tongues? Well, if we open an NIV, it says, as for the court to the west, there were two at the road and two at the court itself. Well, that looks very different, doesn't it? And in one way, yes, the word of God is changed, if we want to use that word, or rather updated in the sense that words change, phrases change. In 1611, at Parbar westward, four at the causeway and two at Parbar, made more sense than it does today. And the word of God changes in order for it to be understand, understanded and be able, and, and in order for it to be interpreted by God's people. But if we hold to absolute certainty and say this translation that I'm holding is the word of God, we fall into a logical fallacy. We fall into an error. We have an overabundance of English translations. We are blessed. If you do any work in any other language, you'll realize that we have far too many English translations. There are no, there's no need for more English translations. And other languages don't have that issue. But in one sense, yes, the word of God is changed, but only to clarify it, to only to make it clear. So we have radical skepticism on one side, we have absolute certainty on the other. And what I want to communicate to you today is confidence that God has spoken and that the words that we hold in our English modern translations are what was revealed to the original authors. Now, in order to jump into this more, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson, because when we hold Bibles in our hands today, there's a, there is a long history that comes along with that. And in my academic work, in terms of text critical issues and the, the historical transmission of the Bible, this is what I study, because the reality is that our modern translations have a, a little bit of... Um, a little bit of credit to give to the manuscript tradition that we see in the ancient world. In particular, if we're talking about Greek manuscripts, handwritten copies of the Greek New Testament, there are approximately 6,000 handwritten Greek manuscripts. That's everything from the 2nd century to the 17th century during the invention of the printing press. And there were even some who didn't think the printing press would catch on, so we have handwritten manuscripts after that. The average size is 459 pages long, which makes 2.6 million pages of manuscript notes. We also have the old Latin translations. There are approximately 10,000 handwritten Latin manuscripts, once again, everything from the 2nd to the 17th century. And then if you include all of the other translations in languages like uh, Sahidic, Boharic, Georgian, Old Church Slavonic, Syriac, Ethiopic, Latin, bless me, um, uh, there's a bit of a tongue twister, then there's a, approximately 24,000 of those manuscripts. The problem is that's a bit of an arbitrary number. So in order for me to communicate that number properly, what I want to do is I want to compare that to the average classical writer who's writing in and around the same time as the New Testament. Because if we compare that to individuals who were writing in antiquity in the ancient world, guys like Plato and Aristotle, they're about to go shoot some hoops, there are approximately... For the average classical Greek writer, there are approximately 20 handwritten Greek, or sorry, handwritten manuscripts. Not 20,000, two zero. In fact, if you were to take the average classical Greek writer and you were to pile their manuscripts one on top of the other, you would have a pile that's approximately four feet high at the most. Now, if you were to do that for the New Testament alone, it would look something like this. That might have been not been a good idea. I only have so much time in this talk.
It is affected, isn't it? Now, at that point, I had to stop. I said, I got to go to bed. This is ridiculous. <laughs> because our pile is 6,600 feet high. And if you took the CN Tower, the Eiffel Tower, the Tokyo Sky Tree, and the, um, the uh, Empire State Building, piled them one on top of the other, you still would not get 6,600 feet high. We're dealing with a ridiculous amount of data. Data that scholars themselves refer to an embarrassment of riches. Scholars use particular words uh, like this. <laughs> bigly. That's bigly. In fact, there's another way we can look at this. We can look at the average time that of the writings from other works in antiquity and the number of manuscripts. And this chart, if you can see it properly, sort of gives us an indication. You have Homer there, and we're waiting 500 years between the time that we think Homer wrote and between when our first copies start to pop up, and we have approximately 1,700 copies of Homer. That's pretty good. Wait for the New Testament. We're waiting 40 years, approximately, for our first copies to pop up, and we have those 24,000, if you want to be specific, 23,769 copies of the New Testament. Now, please don't hear me wrong. What I am not saying is that because we have so many and because they're so early, therefore, this is reliable and it's God's word. That's not what I'm saying. That's a fallacious argument. However, what I am saying is that we treat these other writers as historically reliable. We look at individuals like Plato, like Herodotus, like Sophocles, like Homer, and we look at their writings with the available data, and we agree that we more or less have what they wrote. Now, if we do that with the New Testament, it is infinitely greater. I'm not making a fallacious argument. I'm saying if we hold these one-to-one -one comparison, if we are being consistent there should not be any question, especially the questions that a lot of skeptics hold for the Bible today. In fact, if we do this for individuals like Julius Caesar, who we know about because of writers like Suetonius and Plutarch, both of which we are waiting approximately 800 years between the two to get those first copies, well, if we compare that to simply the life of Jesus, it's not even an accurate comparison with those 24,000 manuscripts and that 40-year period between when the original authors wrote and when our first manuscripts start to pop up, which is why individuals like F.F. F. Bruce say things like, the evidence for our New Testament writings is ever so much greater than the evidence for many writings of classical authors, the authenticity of which no one would dream of questioning. And if the New Testament were a collection of secular writings, their authenticity would, ge would generally be regarded as beyond all doubt. That is the reality that we have when we hold our Bibles today, is that if we are consistent what we hold is accurate and reliable. And as time goes on, we're not getting farther away from the manuscript tradition, from the original text. We are getting closer. If I can pick on the King James in the 1611 um, edition again, the King James isn't based on, or at the time, between 1603 and 1611, wasn't based on manuscripts as much as it was based on printed editions of the Bible, particularly the five editions of Desiderius Erasmus, and then the updates by a guy named Stephanus and Beza, and then um, the 1545 Hebrew Blomberg text. That's what they had in as their available data, and particularly they, for the New Testament, they were going off of the third edition of a guy named Desiderius Erasmus. And Erasmus, in his possession, had approximately seven manuscripts, half a dozen manuscripts, at his disposal, the earliest of which went back to the 11th century. Now, we still have those manuscripts that Erasmus used to compile his New Testament, but we also have a few thousand others. And our earliest go back to the beginning of the second century. Now, if you think about that, the, the King James translation is an incredible 
translation, an incredible work of scholarly achievement because of what they had. And the reality is that as time goes on and as we look into the manuscripts that we've discovered, our earliest ones, the ones that were done in papyri, the ancient, ancient ones have only been found within the last 150 years. And between that, we have not discovered a new reading. Nothing. The text hasn't been radically altered. In fact, it's just validated what we have today. The last 150 years of manuscript discoveries of pulling these testimonies of the Bible out of the dirt has only validated the truth claims of Christianity. And... It has validated the text of the Bible itself. On the screen is a manuscript referred to as P66. It comes from approximately 175 to 200 AD. And if you read with me along on the screen, it says, I put the English up there for your benefit. At John 1.1, this is the beginning of John's gospel. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then if you go down to verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. In fact, I brought with me my facsimile copy of the entire manuscript of P66. And if you go through this with a modern edition of the Greek New Testament, you can follow word for word what we have. This is 200 AD. I can hold a critical edition of the Greek New Testament from printed in 2017 and follow along with a manuscript from the second cent- or from the 3rd century. That's incredible. As time goes on, we are getting closer to the text and it's only validating what we have in terms of the text. This is particularly true for the Gospel of John. In fact, just the the first 14 verses of John, if you hold P66 and then compare it with uh, Erasmus's 1516 edition, I brought with me my copy of his 1522 edition, If you hold his 1516 or the 1519, 1522, 1527, so on and so on, and compare it, it has the exact same number of words in the Greek in the first 14 verses, the exact same number of letters. That's true for um, the modern critical edition of the Greek New Testament, the Nessie Island or the United Bible Society. And that's true for the Byzantine text printed by Maurice Robertson that you can buy. And it's true for uh, the Tyndale House 2017 edition of the Greek New Testament. All of these, at the beginning of John say the exact same thing with the exact same number of words. We have incredible confidence that what we hold is what the original authors wrote back then. Too much evidence. Scholars are pulling their hair out because we just have too much. I knew a guy who studied Xenophon. And for Xenophon, we're waiting 1,800 years for the first manuscripts to pop up. And we have only a handful of manuscripts. And he once said to me, I wish I had as much evidence you have. I wish I had something to go off of. You guys have so much that you're arguing with one another. We can barely argue with each other because all we have is what we have. But you'll notice something because up until this point, I've been talking about the apologetics for Scripture, but that's not actually the title of my talk. The title of my talk is Apologetics and Scripture. Now, that's not to invalidate anything that I've said up until this point. I wanted to to capitalize that because I want you to know that you can have confidence in the text of the Bible that God has spoken to those original authors and those words that the original authors wrote is what we have today. But the reality is that when we're talking about Scripture as the foundation for our apologetic, we are actually talking about something slightly different. We're asking questions like, what was Jesus' view of Scripture? How does Scripture ground truth claims? Without Scripture, how do we ground reality? Because some of the critique that we see in our world, both from outside the church and inside the church, is eroding things like the simple basis of how Jesus viewed Scripture. And if we look at how Jesus viewed Scripture, he said all sorts of things about the text 
of the Bible that he had in his day. He said things like the scriptures cannot be broken. He looks at the religious leaders of his day and he says, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. When he's dialoguing, when he's sparring with the devil in his um, trek in the wilderness, he continually appeals to scripture as the highest basis, simply saying, it is written, for it is written. Again, it is written. When he quotes the Old Testament, he says, David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declares, equating the two, that when David spoke, he does the same thing with Moses. When these individuals spoke, they spoke with an authority that was both of themselves and outside of themselves. He says, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And after the resurrection, when he's on the road to Emmaus, he says, in the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He appeals to the word of God. And ultimately, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, quoting Deuteronomy. These are powerful statements. We can look at these statements and clarify the fact that Jesus had a certain view of scripture, a very high view of scripture. Not only that, but we have instances like Matthew 22, where he's going back and forth with the Sadducees and they're trying to trip him up and they're asking him a specific question. And the, the context of this is that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. No more puns at the Ezra Institute. Got it. <laughs> Are you kidding me? So I can't use the Pharisee one either? Uh, well... Oh, but the Pharisees, they did believe in the resurrection because they were fair, you see. <laughs> Under 35, that's where all this stuff is coming from. <laughs> now, in his response, which is about resurrection, Jesus makes a very interesting comment. He says, but regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? Now, this is a very odd statement that can easily be passed over. But it's strange, both in the English and in the Greek, because the wrong verbs are used. He says, have you not read what was spoken to you? Now, he didn't say, have you not read what was written to you? Or have you not heard what was spoken to you? He says, have you not read what was spoken to you? What is he doing? He's holding his audience accountable as if when they're reading the scriptures, God is speaking directly to them. When we ask, what is Jesus' view of Scripture, we can confidently say it's the highest view of Scripture you possibly can, in that he holds his audience personally accountable to God speaking directly to them. I mean, he goes on to quote Genesis. His audience isn't 1,400 years old. They weren't there when that was spoken. But he holds them accountable as if they were. That's a tremendous statement of what Jesus' view of Scripture was. And ultimately, he appeals to the fact that he says, sanctify them in, by the truth. What is the truth? Your word is truth. We don't just have historical confidence. We have confidence that the text that we hold as the word of God is the truth. We can also look at how the scriptures appeal to themselves because the scriptures are constantly validating themselves. We can look at a lot of the passages that I just quoted from Jesus, but then we have other ones because Jesus is validates and points to the scripture when he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But we also have instances where Paul is going out and he's preaching the gospel and the Bereans, it says, were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see, oops, went too fast, to see where the truth was. They went to the scriptures to validate, to see if what Paul was saying was true. There was a standard that they were looking at in order to glean 
what the truth claims of what he was saying was. We can look at those truth claims and we can validate them by scripture that, that this group in Berea were more noble because of that. And then it says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And then ultimately, Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is, and he uses this, this very interesting word, theopneustos, God breathed. Now, some translations say inspired, but the literal word for word translation is breathed out by God. It's God breathed. That's what we're looking at when we hold the scriptures. In fact, even the resurrection claim is predicated on the fact that it was predicted in the scriptures. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. There's a pos- uh, there's a, a popular narrative in the church today that as long as you hold the resurrection, that's really all you need. Friends, that's a false narrative. It's, it's not the argumentation of Paul. Paul says that these things happen because of the scriptures. Simply saying, Jesus rose from the dead, therefore you should believe it. And those tricky things in the Old Testament and some of those issues in the Gospels, don't worry about those. That's, that's an inconsistent argument. And it's certainly not the argument that the apostles made. We need to be careful what we're talking about. Now, this brings me to the last question. Without scripture, how do we ground reality? You know, I used to think that the, the six blind men and the elephant parable was just a trope until I started doing campus work, until I started interacting with students, and then all of a sudden I'm hearing it all over the place. It's not just a cliche. It is how our world actually thinks about these things. Now, if you're not familiar with the parable, it goes something like this. It was six men of India of learning much inclined who want to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant and happening to fall, his broad and sturdy side at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second feeling of the the tusk cried, oh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp, to me it's mighty clear, this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, he, he up and spake, the elephant to me is very like a snake." The fourth reached out his eager hand and fell about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is mighty plain, he said, is clear the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth who chanced to touch the ear said, I am the blindest man can tell. What this resembles most, deny the fact who can, this marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had began about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, said he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of India disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. But this is the idea that we're all just grasping at different parts of the truth and all the worldviews have little bits of the truth. Here's the major problem. The elephant spoke. The elephant opens his mouth and speaks. And he corrects the folly of the blind man and leads them into what the truth truly is. We have the words of God in scripture. We don't need to be groping around like blind men. We can follow the truth to its ultimate conclusion because we have the word of God preserved and inspired, inerrant and true. And that's why if we come back to Peter in 1 Peter 3.15 and simply ask, why always be prepared? Prepared in what? Where do we find that hope? What is the answer? Well, he tells us earlier 
in the first chapter of his letter. He says, concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories of the world that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. The hope is predicated in the fact that God has spoken and that what he has spoken is theopneustos, is God breathed. And that without God This world is irrational, but we are given a foundation to hold things like logic, like rationality. We are given a foundation for how to interpret reality. We don't have to grope around like a blind man. The elephant has spoken and he gives us his clear commands. Not only is what we have reliable, not only is what we have true, not only is what we have accurate, but what we have is the spoken words of God. And we can look at it and be held account as if God is speaking to ourselves. But the last thing I want to impart to you is the fact that one of, if not the best apologetics you can have, is simply being biblically literate. We have a massive problem of biblical illiteracy a terrible problem of biblical illiteracy. And simple arguments that make no sense against the Bible are trumpeted as these takedowns, and they are not. Simple biblical literacy will take down complicated and what are perceived to be really strong accusations against scripture. Which is why James White says every attack upon the Christian faith includes in some form or another a denial of sola scriptura, scripture alone. Whether it takes the form of blatant denial of scriptural inspiration or comes in the subtle assertion of the need for an infallible authority to interpret the Bible for you, the goal is the same. God's voice is either completely muted or blended in the voice of man so that one is never sure which voice is speaking. In either case, the authority of God's word is compromised and room is made for the man's ideas and schemes. And so I I simply finish with Augustine. For now, treat the scripture of God as the face of God. Melt in its presence. Friends, we have an authority that trumps all authorities. God has spoken And that gives us a foundation to be able to coherently and persuasively and graciously give an answer for the hope that we have. What is the apologetic mandate that is given to us by Peter? What does it say? It starts with, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That's a theological statement. Who is Christ? Why is he Lord? Why should I revere him in my heart? You can find all of the answers to that in the pages of Scripture. And only then can and are you able to give an answer for the reason for the hope that you have and do so with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ will be ashamed of their slander.